special discussion with Prime Minister Honorable Tillman Thomas. The Prime Minister has agreed to speak with us on several issues and we will jump right into the conversation. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you. It's a privilege to be able to sit down and have this discussion with you. It's a pleasure for me too. I'm always willing to talk to the media. <laughs> I know you are. You're always willing. It's one thing I've always said. The Prime Minister is never one to say he will not speak with the media. You're always available. Always, yes. Good. But Prime Minister, we want to get right into the discussion with the what I think is probably at the top of, if not very close to the top of your agenda right now, and that is the current cash flow situation in the country. It recently manifested itself in late payment of salaries for public workers. What is the situation there? Well, as you know that um, we are part of the global community. What happens in North America, Europe, it affects us. And as you know, in recent times, there's been a slowdown in the economic growth, both in Europe and uh, North America. And that has uh, affected us. As a result, we have seen a, a decrease in revenues and an increase in expenses. So we have a cash flow challenge. There's absolutely no doubt about it. So is this... What is being put in place to ensure that at least we can meet basic expenses at the end of this month coming? Well, um, one of the things we've been doing is trying to be more aggressive in resource mobilization. And we are going to step up on the whole issue of resource mobilization. We have also asked the Ministry of Finance to, to prepare proposals as to a protocol so we could uh, really address the, these challenges without creating, you know, inconvenience, we um, believe that all the stakeholders should be adequately informed. Whenever we're faced with such a situation, we are establishing a protocol to, to deal with it. You did mention recently that you were not really happy with how the Ministry of Finance allowed the information to come out. Are you addressing this issue? I mean, it, it is kind of surprising really that the Minister of Finance has not come out and made a statement to the nation to say this is where we are, this is what we can expect. No, I believe in the right time the Minister will do this. I mean the whole issue of timing is something we, um, we want to approach. You see, we are aware of the cash flow challenges and uh, from time to time, you know, situation changes. There are times revenue coming in well and you expect that a uh, certain day you would uh, you know, obtain a certain amount of revenue, sometimes it does not occur. So it is something we have to monitor uh, on a constant basis. And um, as I say, but we recognize that we should give adequate notice just in case to avoid any form of inconvenience. And I want to really apologize again. I did uh, apologize to the public officers for the late payment and I want to place on record my apology because it is something um, we really would want to see everybody be paid on time. Okay. Is there or do you have information on whether or not the Ministry of Finance is actually meeting its targets, its, its revenue targets? You did mention a slowdown in revenue, but is the Ministry able to meet its targets in terms of collecting taxes, in, in terms of investments, in terms of other income earning areas for the country? Now, as I said before, there's been a decline, in, especially in the second um, quarter. We have seen a, a decline in revenue uh, collection. Okay, so is this affecting our debt management as well? Well, to a certain extent, yes. As you know, in 2005, we did a debt restructuring. And uh, as a result of that debt restructuring, uh, the interest rate increased in 2008 and also in 2011. So it is, uh, you know, affecting us to a certain extent. So are we behind on target or, or maybe I should say how far behind are we with our debt service? Uh, we are not too much behind. I think we've been doing fairly well in, in, in that respect. We've been trying to meet uh, our target. 
for when I read you another visit from the IMF team? Um, the exact date I, I can't say as yet. It should you know. be sometime around next month? Or well, it may be, you know, the exact date, but uh, I can't tell you the exact date as yet. Okay. Um, Prime Minister, what's the current situation with the loan demand from Taiwan? Well, this has been before the court, and as you know, um, judgment was given in uh, our favor, and I believe that the, the details have been worked out. I believe um, the matter is, you know, is, is about to be resolved. When you say about to be well, resolved? Well, because we um, got judgment, and on the appeal, again, I, we were successful. So um, I do not know if they'll take it any further, but it seems that... Um, so what, so the Minister of Finance, now we would expect is working behind the scenes well, it, to put a me, schedule in place because at the end of the day, we have to pay this yes, money. Yes, yeah, we have to, yes. Yeah, well, that's what we've been saying that what we have been asking for uh, a schedule of payments. We are prepared to make payments on, on a systematic basis. But as you know that um, at the time when I was taking a, a tough stand against us, but we have always, from the time we came into office, we have been saying that, look, we are willing to honor our obligation, and we are willing to meet our commitments on a systematic basis. Okay, <clears throat> as we are discussing the economy, you had outlined some projects last year in September that were expected to come on stream. One of those is the agriculture feeder road projects, which a lot of people, a lot of workers, have been looking forward to seeing come back on stream. The bids were sent down to Kuwait what is the current situation with well, the feeder roads? The 109 process is now before the, the, the Ministry of Work that is being looked at. And um, uh, with time, I think the, the, um, you know, the, the matter would be uh, dealt with in more detail. But the process is going through now. So a contractor has been selected as it? Not as uh, I, they have contractors have been shortlisted. But as far as selected, uh, yeah, that process is going through. I think that process is going through now. But it must have been about three months ago where the Minister of Works had said that, well, they expect to hear from Kuwait very soon on who the contract should be awarded to. Well, I, but I know the process is going through. I can't, uh, you know, mm -hmm. yes, contractors, have, contractors have been shortlisted, and I think in due course, uh, one will be identified. Right, so at this point, then, you're saying none has been identified as it. No recommendation has come from Kuwait? Well, I think a recommendation has been made, but a, a contractor has not been selected as yet. Okay. What is, without giving away whatever you cannot give away, but what is the recommendation coming out of Kuwait? Well, I wouldn't want to go into details. I wouldn't want to, you know, that's a matter the ministry is still working on this, so I wouldn't want to um, go into details on that. Okay. And the hotel project in Mount Hartman, the minister has given indications several times that this is going to happen. What can you say is the current status on Mount Hartman? Well, yes, I think um, some work has been done on this. Um, uh, the, a company has been identified and negotiations uh, are taking place. A company has been identified in As a partner in, in the process. Uh, you know. Okay. That is a negotiation that's going on or that is something which is signed? No, no, it's going on. It's nothing is going on. The negotiation, the negotiation is going on. on. Yes. So the negotiations right now are not to select a company because you say one has been... Well, one is there's a company of true interest and there's some negotiations going on. With that company? Yes. So it would be too early to say which company Yes, I wouldn't want to, yes. I wouldn't want to go into that. But it wouldn't be too early to say what type of negotiation you're working on with the company. Well, generally, I mean, it, it's, um, it's uh, someone who wants to be part of that process, a shareholder. I mean, it's a, hmm. the, the government has interest and we want to look for uh, another partner, someone who is involved in the hotel business. So how would you be comfortable splitting this partnership, um, government retaining more or, or less? Well, again, all these are details to be worked out. We haven't come to any, uh, you know, conclusion on this matter. But all these have been looked at. And the value of this project, what sort of price tag is being put on it? Uh, well, I can't give you an exact figure, but um, we had mobilized about 100 million to get involved in the process. And uh, we expect the, whoever is coming in as a partner to... Yeah, come up with uh, some money there. Okay. Prime Minister, as the person who is ultimately presiding over the economy of the country, what are, what can you tell us? What are the projections? What can we look forward to 
because absolutely this recession cannot continue. It has to come to a turning point. What can you tell us is going to happen? What sort of timetable for getting out of this are we looking at? Well, it depends again, I say, on the global uh, developments. Uh, it's a really slow process. Um, we have seen um, in the beginning of the year was fairly okay, the second quarter, it's, you know, things have slowed down. It's a slow process. As you know, we set out some pillars of the economy which we are focusing on. We look at um, education, health, and wellness, and you know, we're trying to get this project with the medical school to build that uh, hospital. We are looking at uh, energy and renewable energy. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's tomorrow the Minister for Finance will be signing an agreement for that project in Carrick with a wind energy project. So we are looking at uh, the, the long term to, to create a, a sustainable type of uh, development. I mean, there is a cash flow problem now, but we are laying a, a good foundation. The agricultural sector is uh, doing fairly well. We have seen over 2.5% 2. 2 growth in agriculture. And uh, even recently, I mean, the Standard & Poor's gave us a, a positive uh, type of rating. So there is a cash flow problem, but we have really laid and we are continuing to work on that, uh, that foundation to create a sustainable economy. And looking at the, the tourism, you know, the, the agriculture, and uh, ICT, information and communication technology, that's another area. You have been, no, well, no, when I say you, your administration has been heavily criticized for the economic direction in which it is going. It's been your detractors, the opposition, members of your own party have said it's because of the chosen economic path why we are in the situation we are now. How do you defend your economic policies? I think our economic policies are, are sound economic policies. We just uh, happen to be in office at a time when there is this global economic uh, crisis. I mean, as I say, we have been able to to get things moving in the agricultural sector, which is a very a crucial sector for us. We do not have control <coughs> over what takes place in Europe and North America. And this is where the, the tourism sector has been uh, affected. But in terms of the management of the economy, I, I think we have done uh, uh, fairly uh, well. Uh, we, we are faced with some uh, difficulties, but uh, we have been able to, to, to manage fairly well. And I say we focus in on those um, transformational sectors which we see as, uh, as vital. And we're going to continue uh, working to ensure that so we get the economy going. Two questions to piggyback on that. The agriculture sector, what are the bright spots in the agriculture sector right now? Well, productivity overall, I mean, the, the cocoa industry in particular is doing exceptionally well. I mean, the production in cocoa uh, has, is more than what the, the pre-Ivan uh, production. The production last year surpassed the, the pre-Ivan production, so that shows uh, that industry is moving fairly well. The nutmeg is uh, coming up fairly good. Of course, the industry has been so badly devastated, it's going to take a long time to get back the nutmeg industry to be fully on course. And general production in um, food crops, there's been an increase in, you know, in production of fr fruits and vegetables. We've been exporting um, vegetables to parts of the Caribbean and even to Miami. So are we reducing year. our food import bill? Well, that is the, I mean, uh, food security is uh, part of our mm -hmm. strategy. That is a part of our agenda. Uh, we would like people to consume more of what we, we produce. So in the long run, we could reduce our food import bill. Okay, but we're not seeing that reduction well, not as yet. I, I, systematically, systematically as, yet. as yet. But with time, uh, I, I expect us to see a reduction in that. Okay. So at this point, there is what change would, uh, if any, would you make in the current economic direction that the country is going in? Would you make any change? Well, I say there are there changes in terms of our, we want to produce our way to prosperity. We want to emphasize the importance of uh, productivity. We have to cut back on wastage, especially in like utilities. 
uh, water, electricity, and uh, you know, we believe that it is important that uh, we cut back uh, on wastage in certain areas. We even cut back on, on travel in, in some areas. If travel is not funded, uh, we do not really take the opportunity to travel because the, this is a change that I think is important uh, for us. But I say our focus is to produce our way to prosperity and we need to focus on the uh, transformational sectors and to try to attract investors into the country. We have passed all the necessary laws. We have you know, laid a good foundation to make the country business friendly. But it's because of, again, global economic crisis, we have not been able to attract business as we would want to. But we have laid the foundation for this. Despite the fact that the, the country has been accused of being unfriendly to investors, potential investors, you don't see this as a reason for investors not coming in at this time? No, we are not unfriendly to investors. Uh, we, um, we are quite friendly to investors. I mean, we have been able to, um, to deal with investors above the board. We have, we have gone you know, all out to facilitate investors. We have um, acquired property to get certain investors interested in hotel development to facilitate them. Uh, we have been doing our best to uh, attract in investors into the country. We um, operate above board. We comply with the, the, the laws of the land. We believe that we have to uh, do things in, in the right way. And, um, and not all investors sometimes, um, when they come, not all of them sometimes are genuine. And um, we have to do the necessary due diligence to make sure that the people we are dealing with uh, they are above board. And, what, um, what wouldn't you say, Prime Minister, if you are aggressively pursuing investors, somewhere along the line you may just hit on somebody who is not quite above board, who may slip through the cracks and that, get Yeah, in? that's a possibility, yes. That, that, that's a possibility. We, we don't rule out this. These things happen. So. Okay. And we've seen it happen in the past? Yes, we have seen it happen, yes. <laughs> And because, um, well, we are speaking with Prime Minister Honorable Tillman Thomas. He will be speaking with us on several issues. Right now, we are going to take a short break and we'll be back to hear more from Prime Minister Thomas. 232 News, that is 232-6397, is the number to call for your direct link to the CC6 News Night team. Something happening in your community, call 232-6397. If you want it in the news, call 232-6397, your direct line to CC6 News. 232 News, that is 232-6397. Unlimited Talk, $75. Talk unlimited to over 50 destinations. Unlimited Talk to all local landlines. Landline to mobile, 45 cents. Sign up now. Go watch talk clip. Welcome back. We're speaking with Prime Minister Tillman Thomas, and right now we are going to hear some answers from the PM on some things he said in his recent address on the latest No Confidence motion. Prime Minister Thomas, one of the backbenchers in Parliament, have created quite a stir with this no confidence motion that he has filed with the Clerk of Parliament. You addressed it in some very strong terms in some areas, I would say. But I just wanted to get a little bit of insight from you on some of the things that you actually said in this address. In the opening, you opened bang on the opposition, you know, attacking their and I do say attacking because of the strong language which is used there 13 years in government. Their borrowing was not planned to produce future streams of revenues. Your administration's borrowing, how is it being planned to produce future revenue streams? Well, as I mentioned, I mean, the, what we are involved in, the, our project in Karikou, the, the wind uh, energy project, uh, that is how much of a risk to government is this project because Grenlec is funding the EU is funding how much of a risk is government putting in? Well, it's not too much of a risk. The EU is providing funding for Grenada and Grenlec as the company involved in power generation in Grenada, the 
in involved in the in the project. But this is a grant. It's not. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's a grant. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. But in terms of sustainability, how many jobs are say we're looking at coming out of this project? Because there is certainly to be a lot of work to get this. Well, I haven't got the details, but there will be jobs um, coming out of uh, that. Uh, uh, project. These a lot of these will be new jobs, new technology. How equipped is our workforce to deal with these jobs that will come? Well, I mean, lots of our young people have been trained in ICT and other areas of, of technology, and we expect them to um, uh, to, to benefit uh, from this. Mm -hmm. Again, we are going to um, if the, the hospital project is a project that could um, bring about a lot of employment and services in terms of when you link. Uh, health and tourism, uh, that uh, hospital, teaching hospital, could uh, would be able to uh, assist in really uh, advancing the, the, the economy. Okay, so the hospital, the wind farm, two absolutely great projects, but again, we see that it's not a big risk to government. Is, is it a good thing or a bad thing, or is it strategic planning why we're having these projects without the government being too heavily involved? Well, we see the, the private sector really as the engine of growth. I mean, government is more regulatory. At times, government would come, would come in and give a, a commitment or to give a guarantee. But we expect the, the private sector to uh, take up the initiative and to take advantage of economic opportunities in uh, our society. Where possible, we would work together with uh, agencies of the private sector like we are doing with the Grenada Cocoa Association in building that chocolate plant in uh, St. Max. Again, we see this as something that uh, could bring about uh, employment, to bring in the revenues uh, into the country, and if we could get more people involved in the whole production of, uh, of cocoa. I mean, we support projects like Nutmed, uh, Mr. Dennis Noel. I mean, mm -hmm. utilizing the whatever we produce here in Grenada, taking the raw material and processing it, uh, we see this as areas that could really bring in uh, revenue to create employment. We have this young Mr. Mopson, the Kangeous man, who again, he's in, involved in a project right now trying to uh, utilize more of the fruits that we produce here to process them and to make it available uh, to our market and to our regional market. The, the, the fishing industry, Okay. Uh, these are some of the areas I, I believe that um, the, both the, the, the private sector and government could work together in a partnership to, to stabilize yes, the economy, and, yeah, to, to provide long-term jobs. And a sustainable economy. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that the new national party, while it formed the government, if borrowing that they did was necessary, you said the spending was patently reckless, irresponsible, non-productive, and much of it was programmed to facilitate corruption. Again, this is some of the, what I see as very strong language coming out of this address on the no confidence motion. But I remember sometime last year it was when we had a, it was a news conference that you addressed and you said it would, you would not be wasting government resources to go after Dr. Mitchell and the other people who ran the country because you really did not have enough evidence to pursue these sort of investigations. Has your position changed on it, or why would this be included in your address at no, this time? I didn't say that. I said, where there is evidence, <laughs> are we going to uh, proceed? They, those who are involved in investigation, they, were, they would investigate as to whether there was wrongdoing. It's a matter for the, uh, well, the investigative body. Uh, if there is evidence, we would proceed. If there is no evidence, no. In essence, what I'm saying, we wouldn't go on a wild goose chase. You see, in government, there are times when people engage in corrupt practices, but it is not criminal. You know, Once there is evidence of criminal activity, then you have to proceed uh, criminally. On the other hand, where uh, people abuse the authority, use the position to exploit the state and get involved in corrupt activities, but you have no evidence of corruption. I think you have to bring it to the people. And you have no evidence of criminal activity. Uh, criminal activity. Or you have to go before court. What? Or you have, but you know. Wouldn't it be kind of difficult for someone to engage in corruption to that extent and not commit some crime? Well, it, it, it's possible. Um, 
take for instance uh, something like the Garden Group. I mean, Grenada has been, Grenada has suffered. I mean, monies have gone, and you know, we have to pay all this money. But really, uh, but isn't it a criminal act to take money for the Garden Group? and redirect that money somewhere else where it isn't supposed to go. That's embezzlement, yeah, that's but, stealing. But, but, but to get the evidence, see, that is the difficulty, to get the evidence, the way it has been done. How, how do you obtain the evidence and get that evidence to go before court? You know, that, that, that's it. Just take the, um, the, the, port, the chicken farm, the poultry farm. I mean, lots of money was spent on equipment that never came to Grenada. Again, but to get the evidence to go before court. We have all these debts on, 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 on the country. So the, what you're saying then is there is absolutely no paper trail or other trail to say who collected these money, who paid who, where did the money go? It's, it's a case of people just spending money without making any well, record of it. Well, maybe some trails, but uh, to link it up and also to get a compact case to go for court and to get people to come to testify for the court could be the difficulty. But there's, there obviously there, there, there will be some truth. That's why you got people have been talking about it. Because especially large sums of money, somebody has to know where it goes. It, it has to turn up in a bank, in somebody's pocket, in some something which was purchased. It has to turn up somewhere, except somebody has it under a bed. You know, it it, it has to be there. So when. We talk about not pursuing some of these things. If, the, if all these things are before us, which we can clearly see, yeah. wouldn't it be worth the while to pursue, to go after the evidence because it has to be there somewhere? Yeah, obviously, yeah, I mean, they would try to obtain the evidence. That obviously, this is what we are saying. I mean, we. Because this destroying evidence would be another criminal act. So it, it, but that's it. But sometimes it's difficult the way things are, are being done. Sometimes you cannot get the. Yeah, what is required in a court? It, it, it's different to just, you know, ordinary communication. Okay. You also mentioned in this address on the no confidence motion that the country basically needs help. But the help we need cannot come from outcasts, corrupt politicians, bag carriers, and such like. What do people have in mind when you Well, I'm thinking about, about these? Uh, committed people who are committed to the country, patriotic Grenadians who are willing to work for Grenada to utilize the uh, resources we have here for the benefit of all. Uh, let me give you an example, for instance. Um, let's look at the Grand Beach deal. And there you had a, a, a government actually transferring the people's land to a company, hoping that the company and Issa Nicholas would strike a deal and then build a five-star hotel that transaction collapsed and time book felt that look we had overestimated that property and we prefer to lose four million dollars than to proceed so they abandoned the, the project but the nnp saying that we didn't continue the project there was no project to to continue i'm not sure the, the, the time of people these are not the people to really I mean, for the well, well, Father Hamilton did say that because he spoke extensively with us on it, mm -hmm. on a UDCide program with Byron Campbell. Yeah. He did say because the world market changed, they decided not to pursue the negotiations Precis with Mr. Nicholas. Precisely, mm -hmm. but the NNP saying that we didn't proceed with the project. I'm not sure, I mean, could you trust these people to forge ahead with the development of Grenada? And that, that's, it, that, that's, it, you know, that's an example. We need genuine and sincere, I mean, you know, they could have come out and said to the nation you know, exactly what took place, you know, and, and let us find another way of addressing the, you know, the advancement of the state of Grenada. But it's, it's politics, Prime Minister but Thomas, the, and but, but people... This is, where the, this is where I disagree with you. Politics is not deception and dishonesty. Politics is about governance. You know, we are, you have to govern your home. You have to govern the community. You have to govern the nation. And we must have some values and some standards in the governance we should, process. But, and that is where I, I would disagree with you too, because deception and corruption and deceit has so much become a part of the political landscape. You're almost looking for it. But you see, it should not be. You it see, should not be, but it's there. You see, the, the, the political arm um, should be reflecting the values of the society. The politics is an extension of the people. So you see, and if... You, I mean, if we have a law-abiding, genuine type of uh, society, we need to see all our institutions, the commercial institution, the political institution, 
you know, the educational institutions, the values must be reflected, and the politics is no different. That, that's how I view it. Well, you have spoken publicly about your association with God and the fact that you believe he's directing you. As a matter of fact, you said you're a soldier for him in the political arena. But clearly, these values will not be shared by everyone. We have a senator who has made it quite clear that he does not believe even in the existence of God. So to try and get everybody to be on that page is a clearly difficult, if not an impossible task, wouldn't you say? It's a difficult task, but it's a task we should not neglect because at the end of the day, we want to have a, a society where we live in unity, peace, harmony, and brotherhood. And when you have all this, uh, this dishonesty and this deception, these are the things that bring about criminal activity and, you know, and people have to cover up the tracks in, in, in a society. So the struggle, as I said, is a struggle for a good over We have to resist the, the evil forces in, in society. We should do things that are honorable, things that are noble, you know, I mean, good family values, you know. And so, um, Prime Minister, you actually believe, you're convinced that your stewardship as Prime Minister is a battle against the forces of evil? Well, no, I, I have a political role to play, but I mean, generally, man, I think man in society has to resist uh, evil forces, regardless of whether you're in politics, whether you're in the church, or whether you're in business. There are always forces that are coming to... Uh, you know. <laughs> Forces come into play that you have to somehow to misdirect or to you know to to detract you know. But, and you, but have, you, you have to you have to resist. But part of that stewardship then would be to put in place systems and also people that will deal with these deviants then. Precisely. So uh, to speak, I, I, so I, so rather than trying to get everybody to see things the way probably they should you also have to make preparation for those, put systems in place to deal with those who won't. Precisely, I agree with you on that, yes. Okay, on to Mr. Carl Hood, whom you also spoke about in the No Confidence Address. You, says he, you said he has fulfilled his desire to join the ranks of the NNP. Why would you say that about the goodly MP? Well, he said so, he said he, um made a request to the speaker to that he would prefer to move on the side of the opposition. He, he but does, does that mean he's joining them and promoting whatever they promote and being a part of that? Well, um, one does know. You could only, I mean, uh, assess on a person's conduct, what he's saying and what he's doing. And you also say his motion was a blatant act of disobedience and dishonor. Who was he disobeying and who was he dishonoring? I think the people who's, who, who voted him into parliament. Uh, you know, uh, an MP doesn't come from the sky. An MP is there to represent uh, people and uh, people support you on a particular platform along certain plans and programs, certain values. And I think you have to act on behalf uh, uh, of, the, of the people uh, as a representative. You know, so I, I would expect you to um, meet with your constituency and discuss so, so, a matter. So you would say he's dishonoring the wishes of the people that he is representing. Would that would that be your assessment of saying he's disobedient and dishonorable? Well, in a sense, I mean, put it in the political sense. Uh, um, you have vo uh, voted to represent people in, in uh, the, the parliament of the country. You but, ought to reflect the aims, aspirations, and values of the, uh, of the people. But he has come out and said that he didn't work with the NNP to file this motion. The NNP has come out and said he didn't work with them to file the motion. But you have clearly said that this is an act of the NNP in collusion with MP Hood. Who do we believe? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, the timing of the motion and the statements that, that were made by the leader of the opposition coincided with the filing of the motion, you know. Because it's, it's, it would be, I mean, I wouldn't want to be in a position to say that, well, we have to take the prime minister's word because he's more trustworthy than Mr. No, Hood no, I'm, I'm not asking to do that at all. No, I'm not asking to do that at all. Like with time, I think people would see, I mean, yeah. people uh, would assess, there are people who know what's going on. There are a lot of 
you know, is there something there you know? Meetings. Yeah, there are certain things you wouldn't yeah, bring to the public. Some, some things you know that you Obviously, didn't Obviously, there are certain things say. we wouldn't want to say, to, say publicly. Meetings, you know. meetings letters pass. Not letters, <laughs> private meetings and discussions and, all, you know. There are and, and you would have known of this happening before <laughs> the motion was filed. Yeah. Yeah. Is that everything, you know, we, we would want to reveal to the public? Yeah. Okay. Well, we want to move on quickly because we don't want to spend the rest of the time just talking about this. But um, there was also this statement that there may be men who think that they are more important than others. Egos and ambitions take precedence over the welfare of the people, etc., etc. Who Who are the people you're referring to here again? But again, um, yeah. Though see, uh, they, they will experience their political demise at the hands of their constituents in the fullness of time. Yeah, well, we are all servants of the people. And um, we should not uh, behave as if we are more than the people who voted us into, uh, into office. This is why we need to maintain that sort of a, a contact and, and dialogue uh, and, and act and on behalf of the, people? of the people. And on that note, I would say, what did you mean when you say the government will not be cheated out of its term in office? Well, that's, I made a statement in the sense that, look, it seems as pure mischief. You know, here you're just trying to get at the government for no strong reason. You didn't, you didn't set out a case. I mean, you've been in a government for the last three years or so. You never present a proposal or a narrative as to another direction. And here you're coming now. Because you are not in, in, in the government anymore, you're taking an approach uh, to, to the But how could government be cheated out of its term in office? You, uh, you are elected into yes, office, yes. and it is the people who will decide Precisely. how long you're going to stay. So yeah. when you say will not be cheated, you see this motion as maybe being able to overturn the government and so that it would end before the five years. Well, it's a up. possibility, yeah, if, if you could get the numbers. That, that's a possibility. Is there going to be a parliament sitting before the convention, you think? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, the speaker is, uh, you know, has, is, is one of the main posts in the parliament. We have to, um, I cannot decide on my own single-handed. Well, not on your own, <laughs> certainly, but I'm sure you would have been in discussion with we'll the, lead, have discussion the leader of government the, business. With the, with the, with those here, the relevant stakeholders, we'll have discussion with the relevant stakeholders. So, so what's the strategy going forward? Parliament or no parliament? Well, we're not sure yet. Uh, parliament is on recess. I mean, this, the last, this parliament has been very active in terms of its, its legislative agenda. And, um, You've basically been having a parliament sitting every month since the beginning of the year. So yes. Yeah, we right up to that. August before the carnival celebration. July, that one in July. Yeah, the last one yeah. was late July. Yes, but the parliament is on recess now. Uh, yeah. And you have not set any time as yet. Well, again, well when I say you, not, again, <laughs> I don't mean you by yourself, but yeah. you and the other parties involved have not yet decided when, before the convention, after the convention. Yeah, we, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, it, we are going to operate within the constitution to do what is right what is you know democratically uh, uh, acceptable. the constitution allows you yeah. well a sitting every six months yeah. so you would be within the constitution so that's not true, to yes. have a sitting in yes. six months but is this something being considered well lots of things have been considered i mean you know we, we have to consider you know what is in the best interest uh, of the people of Grenada. And I do ask the question because several of my colleagues in various sections of the media have reported that this is something which government is considering. So now that I'm sitting here with you, is this something which, is this one of the options being considered yeah, well, in dealing with the motion? Several options would be uh, put on the table, you know, and we go look at uh, what, uh, whatever we see as in the best interest of the people of Grenada, we're going to uh, proceed along that line. Okay. Well, we are still in discussion with Prime Minister Thomas, and we will take a short break. We'll be right back. Unlimited talk, $75. Talk unlimited to over 50 destinations. Unlimited talk to all local landlines. Landline to mobile, 45 cents. Sign up now. Go watch, talk, click. 
232 News, that is 232-6397, is the number to call for your direct link to the CC6 News 19. Something happening in your community, call 232-6397. If you want it in the news, call 232-6397, your direct line to CC6 News. 232 News, that is 232-6397. Welcome back. We are in discussion with the Honorable Prime Minister Tillman Thomas and at this moment we are going to ask him to put on his cap as political leader of the National Democratic Congress. The NDC I think has been in the news every single day. There is something to be said about the NDC party. At this point, where is your party positioned? NDC is now on a reorganizing uh, you know, stage. We're trying to reorganize the party to get all the constituencies organized, all the polling division uh, organized so that we are preparing for the convention on September 30th. Uh, the, the party has not been well organized. I mean, so now we are really you know, getting the organization together having elections at the constituency branches, get executives, you know, getting the party more active and inclusive to bring in new people into the, uh, the political party. Um, the party is reorganized. I think that's a fairly nice and diplomatic way to say it. But the fact is the party is divided. You have members who have gone one way and members who have gone another way, it's divided. So in reorganizing, is this to bring these two factions back together or is, or is it building a whole new NDC? Uh, the party is not really divided. The, the history of any organization, especially a political party, from time to time, membership changes. That, that's the nature of organization. I mean, every political organization usually have new persons coming in at different times, especially leading up to uh, an election. There may be people with different views, uh, and, you know, different approaches, and even within organizations, you have factions. So I, I wouldn't really call it city parties divided. They, we may have differences on issues, but when you look at the last two rallies we held, both in Grenville and Guav, the mass of the party is not divided. There may be differences among individuals and maybe small groups, but the base of the National Democratic Congress is not divided. You have referred to certain sections of the party as leftists. These leftists, um, what role do you see them having in a future in D.C.? Well, I haven't really referred to them as leftists, you know. I, you know, I, I, you know mm. I, I said I fought them before. <coughs> And I'll fight again. You see, it's the, it's the approach. What I regard as propaganda and deception in the politics, I'll always fight against it, be it left, right, or center. It, 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 the, the fight is really against, of course, most of the practices that, that had emerged recently, they were practices in that period when the left was in, in control, the deception and the you know, trying to undermine you know, and going over and say that um, the political leader, the dictator, they have no voice in parliament, in cabinet, and these these are not true. So I mean, it is uh, the, the the left has used propaganda very effectively. So it's really it's more. The, the, so you're referring to it more as a system, a sort of mode of operation, rather well, the mode than of operation, people. Yeah, it's more, a mode of operation is a pattern of behavior that people probably be part of a culture, uh, and and you know, and I think we have to we have to bring in some. Some balance, uh, you know, some, you know, some genuine debate in the in the politics instead of the intrigue and the undermining and the, you know, the. But the some of some of the strongest public statements that have been made about members of the party have come from some of the people who are very close to you. Yes. Isn't doesn't this contribute to this sort of undermining of people within the party? Like statements like what, for instance? Um, like when Senator, the Minister of Information, had said that there is a group within the party that's basically planning to take over the party, and he named names. Mm -hmm. 
you know, he said Peter David, Minister Roberts, and other people were named as being part of this group mm -hmm. that's trying to undermine the leadership of the party. Isn't this in itself undermining whatever little hope there was of meeting with these people and having a discussion with them and saying, look, guys, we know what you're up to, so let us sort it out? Well, again, it depends. You see, you cannot mislead the public. Uh, you know, and you have to be frank and honest about the situation. And if the Minister of Information was giving information about a situation which he had direct involvement with, you know, what, what I mean, what, what could I, um, you know, there's not much we could do about it. He was reporting uh, about a situation, a discussion he had with a, a particular person. Okay. You know. And this was a way of, well, letting the public know then exactly what are some of the dynamics Precisely. that, that were going Precisely, what caused the problem. You, you, that, you see, instead of um, trying to pretend that all is well, uh, you know, there, a time, maybe the time has come for us to come out and say, look, and, you know, set out what are the problems, how are we going to solve the problem, whether we could forge ahead together, if not, let's see how we could, um, Okay, you know, well, MP, MP David recently announced that he will not be contesting the position of General Secretary in the party or any other executive position, he has said. Going into this convention, do you have a preference, maybe without maybe without or with, if you choose naming names, of what you would like to see the executive of the party look like coming out of the convention? Well, I would like to see an executive that is uh, committed to the party and what the party stands for, an executive that is willing to work as a team, a cohesive team, you know, uh, an executive that, you know, understand and, and, and appreciate the situation we are uh, faced with. But at the end of the day, the delegates to, to decide that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the, at the last uh, convention, um, I was not too happy with, with the person that uh, was being promoted as chairman. But the executive, the, the delegates didn't agree with me. So, you know, that, that's history. But I mean, that's, I'll always have to live with, we have to live with the democratic um, decisions will of the people. Will you be, as political leader, be throwing your support behind anyone for any particular position? Well, Sometimes, yes. I mean, you know, we are in the interest of the organization, if you are committed to an organization, you would want to see people in that organization who would uplift and advance the cause of that organization. And I think it is part of the role of a political leader to see if you could get persons to enhance and, and to advance the, the cause of the organization. Um, after the convention, at some point, we do expect that you will be putting out 15 candidates, of course, going through the process, the party process. We do expect that you'll be naming your 15 candidates to go forward in the election. There are, like MP David, who has said he will be contesting, MP Gilbert, who has said he will be contesting, MP Roberts has also indicated that she will be back on the ballot. Are you comfortable going back on a platform with these people? Well, if they do not share the, the views and the, the, the values that I share, I mean, they wouldn't be comfortable with me either. So, I mean, um, we may, we all could, it's a democratic society, we all could contest the elections under different uh, umbrella. I mean, I, I think it's a free and open society, uh, it's a democratic society. I think they should, um, what they stand for, I think they have a right to go out and articulate their positions and let the people know where but, they stand on issues. None of them... None has indicated that they are leaving the NDC, but they want to run. Uh -huh. And looking forward... But again, but it's, it's, at the end of the day, it is the constituency to a certain extent to decide that. I cannot decide that. Generally, constituencies recommend, you know, candidates to the executive of the party. I cannot de determine that. But that would be... I would have some input, but it's the executive who would recommend who they see as the, the candidate or they want to rally with. And the constituency or the constituency branch making a recommendation to the executive of the party. Do you see a possibility of maybe the delegates making a recommendation that doesn't sit well with a new executive that, of course, will come out after the convention? If, if that should happen, what would be the, how would, how would that be handled? Well, the executive has to discuss it. It doesn't matter for discussion. Okay. okay. Um, going forward again, as far as the campaigning is concerned. The last NDC campaign we see, it was the campaign against the NNP was on corruption. 
is this going to be one of the strategies going forward again? And of course, I'm not asking you to reveal all your party yeah. secrets here, but are you still going to be campaigning on that platform for I the mean, next election? Yeah, we have to campaign on a platform of governance, a platform of trust. Yeah, we, we, I mean, the, a, a question of our management of the, the economy. Uh, these are some of the, the I think the economy, uh, the issue of trust more than anything else, I think would be a major issue. What will be the successes coming out of your government that you will stand on in the platform, on, on the election campaign? campaign? Well, there are several. I mean, I would say the, what we have done in the youth empowerment for, for the young people of the country, the whole issue of the scholarship uh, desk we have established, the, the free uh, school books, the energy for the poor project where we want to help in you know, the decentralization of uh, TAMSIS in particular. We have video conferencing now both in Kariku and uh, uh, St. Patrick's. The improvement in community roads, small roads in the various uh, villages, various par parishes. We've been able to do lots of um, small projects. You know, I mean, sports, we have been up to last week. Uh, uh, sporting um, basketball court was open in St. Andrews, the right in Tantin here, we had the, um, uh, the, the pavilion for in Tantin. We have the market square, we've been in the, walk on the market square in, in Grenville. And they, they have, we have been able to do uh, yes. lots of things. Well, there are things that has happened which you will stand on proudly as achievements of the administration. Definitely, especially the good governance agenda. I mean. I've been saying that um, we, uh, as a government, have been able to see that um, when the time came and they had to appoint a commission of police, we didn't just handpick somebody. The Public Service Commission advertised the position, a panel was selected, interview conducted, and they appointed somebody. That didn't, in recent times, under the past administration, that would never and, happen. And you would say on any platform there was absolutely no political involvement in the appointment of the commissioner? Precisely. Okay. Um, you have lost the support of four of your elected MPs, which means I think it's MP who has come out and say there is no automatic support now for anything that goes into parliament. Are you presiding over a minority government at this time? Well, uh, technically from a numbers standpoint, the, again, uh, we're not sure because um, there are two MPs who have not really stated their position clearly. We don't know where, where they stand. So um, it, it, it's hard to tell. That, that, you know, that's some of the difficulties uh, we face with. But, but, you, but even so at this point, you know you do not, as you say, you don't know where they stand. That's so it, their yeah, support yeah. is There's not. There's no certainty as well. Not not have you been meeting with them, speaking with them, yeah, at, at least to get the support in Parliament for whatever projects the government wants to. Uh, put not forward. really. I, I haven't done it. Then, no. Is that something which is going to happen? Maybe before well, the next Parliament sitting. I, I expect them to support whatever is in the interest of the country. Look, <laughs> look what happened in the last Parliament when two MPs voted against this um, insurance bill. I mean, you see how the people came down against them. You see, when you're an MP, you're representing the people, and you have to do what is in the interest of the people. There you had a, a law dealing with regulation. After we have been through all these problems in this country, we're trying to regulate the financial sector. And you're voting against it. I mean, uh, how will the people see you? So I don't think that I have to ask anybody, an MP, to support something like this. But you know? it, it should be automatic. The people, we, we have to um, but pass laws to benefit you, no, people. No, that, that is true. Technically, that is true. You shouldn't have to ask them to support anything. But at the same time, because the relationship is not where it should be, as you see, two voted against the insurance bill. It didn't pass. Is it going back to the parliament? Is that bill going to go back into the parliament? Well, in due, uh, with time, I expect it to go back to the parliament. So what, and, and just to stray a little bit, that bill was not passed. So what was the contingency plan for dealing with Garfin, just to divert a little bit from our discussion. Well, there's no particular con there's a law governing Garfin, uh, as it stands. No, this was um, some amendment. I mean, there's, uh, I think that when the time comes, the, the law will be brought back to, uh, I expect, go back to Parliament. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, PM, is your party 
ready? Are you ready for the general election, which is due sometime next year? What we're doing and what is, you know, need to be done, are we preparing it? It's a process. It's, you know, are we, we are doing the necessary work, in particular, getting the party organized and, and mobilizing and informing the people. That's what we are doing. The, uh, as recent, very recently, we did an interview with the leader of the opposition, and he has come out and predicted that the prime minister will not retain his seat. How confident are you that you will retain this seat? Well, um, the leader of the opposition has from always saying that the, the last election he said to so the one before, um, as one fact in the 2003 election, his famous words were that the people made a mistake. After the 2003 election, the people made a mistake. In 2008, they made a bigger mistake. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I don't judge by the leader of the opposition at all. He, 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 um, he just says things. I mean, like, you know. No, we're not judging by him, but he has one perspective, and I know you will have a different yeah. perspective. Well, no, well, but, mean, no, but no. He, that has always been, he, he always said that I would, um, mm. I, I would lose that seat. I mean, not only he, several, several persons um, in, in the political arena have been saying that. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I listen to them, but I, I just do what I have to do. You know? <laughs> and do you see yourself retaining your the 11 seats which the NDC won in 2008. You see yourself retaining, getting more, getting less? I mean, it's hard to tell. I mean, a day in politics is a long time. We don't know an election. So many things could happen. One doesn't know what will happen when the time comes. Mm. Yeah. Because one of the other speculation in the public domain is that without the popularity of the St. George's MP, and maybe the popularity of other MPs who would have been on the ticket the last time, then the NDC's chances may not be as good. It, do, do you subscribe? To no, that? I don't subscribe to that at all. Uh, I mean, NDC supporters, they support the values, the standards, the, what we stand for as a, as a political party. I don't think it's about personality. I, I think this is where I mean, they are making the mistake. We have NDC had stronger personalities in the past, and they left, but NDC continues. And those would have passed by, they would go, go the different way, the NDC would continue. I, I'm not um, really perturbed by this uh, at all, because that has been the history of NDC. I would move out of NDC, and NDC would continue as a, a very vibrant political organization. All of us would move out, so, and it would continue. Well, so Prime Minister, you would say that regardless of who stands on the NDC platform, that the party will expect to win the next election? Definitely. I, 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 Okay. I'm going to give you maybe a minute, Prime Minister, for any closing remarks you may want to make. Well, I just want to give the people of uh, Grenada Carry County to make the assurance that uh, as a party, uh, we are committed to the, the good governance agenda. We are willing to work with all the stakeholders in society. And we believe that we have to promote what is good for Grenada. We recognize the uh, importance of economic development, but at the same time, we have to be careful as to how we forge ahead as a, as a people. We must be patriotic. We must be a people of, of standard. And we have to see Grenada as a, a place that we have a responsibility uh, to manage for the benefit of all the people of Grenada, Caribou, and Peter Martin. And I'm positive that when the time comes, the people of Grenada would give us that support. OK. And uh, one final question that I must ask. The, is there any friction developing in the relationship between you and your finance minister? Absolutely not. No, no, I, 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 again, okay. it's a lot of speculation. People try to create division. And, I mean, I'll give you an example. I don't know if you were there. The, there was a, a youth a parliament, a meeting of youth parliamentarians down at youth center. Um, MPC ones made some comments, and I made some comments opposite you know, to what he said. And the media took it as if we had you know, a division between us. It just shows you the mentality. Sometimes I wonder some of the media people how they um, analyze and assess situations. I cannot speak for my colleagues. I will not <laughs> even attempt to speak for my colleagues at all. But I say thank you very much thank you. for affording me this opportunity yeah. and all the best. That was a discussion with the Prime Minister of Grenada, Honorable Tillman Thomas. Thank you very much for viewing.
do have a good evening.